Both TV shows and films are embracing the darkness like never before, and there have been several notable cases in recent years that have had people wondering why. Why are these movies and shows so dark to the point where I can't see them? It's a fair question, and by now, there has been plenty of feedback from filmmakers, cinematographers, industry insiders, fans, and armchair critics over what exactly is going on here. So I wanted to take the time to really break down just how dark some of these shows are, how they compare to older material that had similar cinematography, and what might be driving these creative choices, especially in TV shows. There's a ton to cover here, from the reason they display poorly on most people's screens, to the lackluster compression used in streaming and broadcast, and later on, I'll show you some basic ways that TV shows can achieve these dark color grades, and what those grades might have looked like on shows of the past. For those unaware, movies and TV shows have been getting darker. This has been a trend for some years now, but probably the most hysterical reaction came from Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 3, The Long Night, back in 2018. As the episode aired, I'm sure you all know, many people were literally lost in the dark, searching for details obscured by bad displays and even worse video compression. Game of Thrones in general was a pretty dark show when it came to lighting and cinematography, but it was never this dark. The fallout of the episode was so intense that the cinematographer of the episode, Fabian Wagner, came out and defended his work. Wagner says that the majority of the darkness in the episode is thanks to the nighttime shoot, with the rest of the atmosphere produced on set through lighting choices. Another look would have been wrong, he says. Everything we wanted people to see is there. So the lighting choices were deliberate, and I have to imagine that he sat in on the color grading session as well. Now, it goes without saying that these are professionals working at the highest level, and the budgets available for adequate lighting are certainly there. These aren't independent productions with limited budgets that have to make the most of a small lighting package. Their decisions are well-informed and artistically intended. Still, the producers probably took this criticism to heart going forward, right? Right? A few years later, House of the Dragon featured a similarly dark episode, though not exactly for the same reasons. The issue here was largely due to a bad day-for-night color grade. It's impossible to know for sure what production choices or realities went into this look. It could have been decided fairly late to convert these shots, or the budget simply wasn't there to shoot this at night. I don't want to come down too harshly on the work of these professionals, but I don't think the result was convincing anyone. So I think it's still fair to question some of the decisions made here. But why? Why are these shows so dark? It's happening in movies too, though the effect isn't quite as bad because movie theaters usually have proper ambient lighting, not to mention they're shown in pristine quality. They're also more consistently calibrated than home environments, though even some theaters you'll find projectors that are just too dim. Anyway, the broadest explanation for the darkness of modern images is that there have been several huge technological changes in filmmaking in the last 15 years or so, most notably the wide availability of extremely light-sensitive digital cameras. It cannot be overstated how digital capture has changed the industry. It's an entire conversation unto itself, but the short version is that cinematography's embrace of digital took a few years to really take off. The overall aesthetic wasn't there, dynamic range was questionable at best versus film for quite a while, color science was really hard to determine, and the resolutions were, relatively speaking, quite low. Some would probably argue that until the debut of the Aria Alexa in 2010, digital was hit or miss. Don't quote me on that, of course, but I have a feeling some people would agree with me on that. One strength digital has long had, though, was a far higher sensitivity to light relative to film. Notably, Michael Mann's Collateral was shot on the Viper Filmstream camera back in 2004, and the interior driving shots were minimally lit and relied on the way the camera exposed shadows. This is something that simply would not have been possible with film. Fast forward to 2010, and you have the social network shot on the Red One. Around this time, you really start to see broader, more diffused light sources that played to the strengths and weaknesses of digital cameras at the time. But it's not just that digital cameras are more sensitive in lower light. At this time, digital cameras still didn't quite reach the dynamic range of film. And even more critically, highlight roll-off, or the way that the brightest parts of the image fade into pure white, was often harsh and to be avoided at all costs. This is why softer, more diffused lights were preferred with digital, and today, combined with a desire for extremely naturalistic, almost exclusively motivated lighting, softer light sources are just everywhere. 
Digital cameras nowadays have, on the high end at least, exceeded film's dynamic range, but the behavior of their capture can still be less forgiving to highlights than film is, and their ability to save an underexposed image is still hard to beat. This demo from 2019 by Bill Lawson shows what happens when you push both film and digital either up or down in exposure. Now, these are still images to be fair, but as you can see, the film version of this shot only really survives to about two stops of underexposure. Minus three stops and below have absolutely crushed milky shadows that offer no detail whatsoever. Even when he goes all the way to minus 10 stops, the digital image, while unacceptably dark and noisy, still has a recognizable shape and image, while the film version is simply a gray blob. In the opposite direction though, increasing the exposure immediately shows how forgiving film is in the sky details. The digital image here can handle almost three stops of overexposure, but even by two stops, things are getting a little harsh. By the time he pushes four stops, the sky is almost completely white and the highlight details of the fabric are lost. Skipping ahead to plus 10 stops, and the film image has definitely lost some sky detail, but the result is more of a hazy, faded look, whereas the digital image is just totally white. I'm skipping the details behind this because it can honestly go on for hours and I really don't have time to discuss photographic exposure science or theory, but the basic idea is that digital's ability to capture shadows has given cinematographers a previously unavailable way to minimally light their sets and to produce an image with subtle, subtle shadow detail. Digital delivery and projection of these images as opposed to film prints also means that the resulting color grades can be very, very dark. But just how dark? We can acknowledge that many recent movies and TV shows look darker, but can we measure this beyond our subjective sense of how it looks to us? Absolutely. Let's take a look at some scenes from The Long Night in Da Vinci Resolve, I have it right behind me, and bring up the waveform monitors. Without getting into it too much, waveform monitors are a fundamental tool used to gauge brightness and exposure when shooting and grading video. Now, for those who've used image editors like Photoshop, the basic idea is similar to a histogram, but you get a better spatial view of where the brightness values lie within the image. I've set the viewer to show a zero to 100 percentage instead of luminance values, and some people out there might still refer to this as IRE. I'm one of them. Darker images tend to have most of their information in the lower regions of the monitor, and brighter images tend to have them in the upper regions. A very contrasty image with lots of shadow and highlight detail all in between will fill out the monitor from top to bottom. There's no real rule as to where exposure must lie, other than 18% gray and such, but we're not gonna get there. Basically speaking, anything below zero is lost and anything above 100 is also lost. We can see in many of the battle scenes here that there is very little information above 25 IRE or so, which means essentially that all the shadows and midtones have been crammed into this tiny fraction of the total available dynamic range. If you look at shots where bright light sources appear, like flames, though they do peek into the upper regions a little bit, it's only faintly so. And the way they overexpose into pure white is honestly excellently controlled. I'm gonna get back to this in a little bit. Looking at episode seven of House of the Dragon, you can see pretty much the exact same thing going on. The darkest shots have a densely packed lower region of the waveform with many shots dipping below 20 IRE in the entire frame. If you look close enough in these images, you can still determine where the light sources are coming from. Beyond the obvious things like fire and explosions, you have giant light sources highlighting the backsides of characters in almost every shot, and there's clearly enough ambient light to fill out faces and shadows themselves. In other words, we can see the effect of the lighting, so the bulk of what we perceive as darkness here is the result of the grade. So you can see how dark these images actually are, but why are they rendered so poorly for most viewers? Where do I even begin with this? Very generally speaking, HDTVs and now HDR TVs allow for a much darker picture to be visible overall. The bigger size, resolution, and the brighter displays simply let the viewers see more than before. So filmmakers work within those new expectations. Older standard definition broadcasts could lose lots of shadow detail in the lower resolution transfers of film footage and consumer CRTs while possibly offering excellent black levels were just wildly inconsistent in quality. TV shows had to accommodate this. Now, ironically, a lot of LCD screens are absolutely terrible for shows and movies with a lot of dark scenes. Backlight bleed can ruin some scenes, as I'm sure many of you have noticed before. 
When The Long Night first aired, it's probably safe to say that the vast majority of viewers were watching on an LCD screen. Factor in that many people were probably viewing on low to mid-tier LCD screens that didn't feature multiple dimming zones or VA panels, and you start to have one of the worst ways to view it to start. OLED screens could alleviate a lot of this with their ability to display true black, but even on an OLED, House of the Dragon Episode 7 was still difficult for me to watch. Next, both broadcast and streaming compression are simply not up for the task of delivering this kind of content, especially in 2018. In the US at least, most linear cable broadcasts still follow the ATSC standard as it's called, which at the time of the Long Night's broadcast likely meant a 1080i broadcast. Now the interlaced nature of this isn't necessarily a problem, believe it or not, as most consumer TVs can handle that properly. The real problem here was the bitrate and codec. Over the air ATSC using MPEG-2, yes, the same MPEG-2 from 1996 that's been used on DVDs, can reach around 18 megabits per second. But cable broadcasts are often much lower than this, potentially reaching somewhere around 12 megabits depending on your provider. This is horrendously bad for anything at that resolution, but it is flat out unacceptable for something this dark. Darkness in general is really difficult for codecs, especially in 8 bits, to render correctly. Those incredibly small details and subtle gradations in detail get smoothed out into murky nothingness or blocky messes. That's simply impossible to decipher. On the streaming end of things, it likely wasn't much better for most viewers. While most streaming at that point was H.264 based, the bit rates for streaming were still far too low to render these scenes correctly. The resulting artifacts were different than their cable counterparts, but probably not much better to look at. So combine all these factors, and the viewing environment is just the perfect storm for ruining the image. So if viewers can't see these images, why grade them this dark to begin with? First off, everyone wants to blame someone for this. Yes, these are conscious choices made in production and post-production, but they're not without merit. The biggest creative reason is probably the desire for a more cinematic experience in the home. The golden age of television has ushered in more compelling, more dramatic storytelling, and with that comes more cinematic, stylized approaches to shooting those images. Darkness is a narrative and atmospheric tool. Could you imagine a modern Batman film that isn't sunk in the darkness? Or horror film? Now, the change in styles has manifested in quite a few ways over the years. Cinematic trends come and go. But most of the push for this has come from technology. If you look at any show in the mid-2000s that made the SD to HD TV switch, it's probably most apparent there. Bigger, brighter screens, combined with digital broadcasting and of course a 16 by 9 ratio, meant that cinematographers could start to light with more shadows in mind. Still though, most primetime dramas of that era were shot on film, and so the lighting practices had to expose for film first and foremost. Once digital capture became the norm though, we started to see this change towards ambitiously darker lighting and grading. In my opinion, and I cannot stress enough that this is just an opinion, it's an unrealistic expectation from the production that most viewers should have either a properly calibrated display or be willing to shift their settings around, I guess. When The Long Night aired, there were more than a few think pieces about the importance of display calibration or using neutral settings on your TV to see the episode as it was intended. There was also talk about watching it in a darker environment, which is not wrong, but good luck convincing some people. Now, it's true that most consumer TV screens are poorly calibrated, if at all. Many people leave their settings as they are out of the box, and anyone who's visited their parents for the holidays only to find motion smoothing enabled knows exactly what I mean. But this isn't a fair expectation. For one, calibration goes above most people's heads, and it's unrealistic to expect them to understand things like white point or gamma curves, black level, color spaces, and so many other variables that are at play. More importantly, a good color grade intended for home viewing should render well across multiple screens. In music production, a mix generally isn't considered good until it sounds decent on a wide range of devices, especially the bad ones like earbuds and cell phones. We generally don't ask people to calibrate their headphones or to enable special EQ to compensate for bad sound reproduction, and we shouldn't ask the same of video. But let's say we could ask people to do this. It still doesn't change the fact that poor compression, bad viewing environments, and older display technology puts a limit on how good this could possibly have been. 
You might be wondering to yourself, plenty of movies, especially older ones, embrace darkness while maintaining visibility. It's true, darkness doesn't have to literally be dark. I tried to find examples of shows with similar set design and cinematography to demonstrate this, and it just so happens that I recently finished watching HBO's Rome. Now, most of it is shot in brighter environments, but every so often you get dark scenes that render very cleanly. Shooting on film is, of course, the biggest reason for this, because it naturally enforces brighter lighting practices. But given the television production lineage it has to Game of Thrones just a few years later, it's hard not to notice this difference. Part of this is, of course, changing trends as well, but we discussed that before. On the cinema side of things, one example I've always found fascinating is Army of Darkness. You have dark battle scenes at night with fire, explosives, smoke, but I always found this battle to look, well, easy to see. To be fair, cinematography has obviously changed a lot since then, so let's take a look at Evil Dead Rise, which is the latest entry in the series, and of course, it's gonna feature lots of dark cinematography. You can see the change in trends here, with dark shots featuring much of that same low IRE that The Long Night has. There's nothing wrong with this, but in a movie theater setting, this is much more acceptable. Also, in some of the shots, even though it is dark, you can see more light sources spreading across the background details, separating the subjects just enough. In Game of Thrones, it's harder to make this work in what is essentially a void of darkness, and that was kind of the point of the episode. So trust me, this is all intentional. But what if our intentions were different? The beauty of the way light and photographic principles work is that the ideas behind what makes a great work or not work applies to both the old and the new. We've already established that these dark scenes are lit and oftentimes with far more light than you realize. What happens if we attempt to grab scenes that are roughly similar in nature and grade them to match one another? I give this a very quick shot in Da Vinci Resolve to see if I could approximate the looks, and believe me, I'm not a pro at this. I also don't have access to the original files to really get this right, but I hope it gets the point across. Let's take a look at those scopes again for Game of Thrones. Ouch. Many of these shots barely register above 20 to 30 IRE, and that's all the information. What if we tried to make it look similar to a shot like this from Army of Darkness? They're fairly alike. Both shot at night, both the sharp rim lights highlighting the subjects, and smoke and fire across the frame. They're obviously not exactly the same, but despite how bright this shot is, look at it. The scope has much softer, denser spread of information, almost hitting 50 IRE. We still register it in our minds, though, as nighttime. I'm going to mainly use my eye, but the waveform is our friend here for getting a sense of where specular highlight detail and shadows need to be. Despite being extremely dark, Game of Thrones still keeps its highlights pretty high. If we increase the gain and try to reduce our gamma and lift a bit to get the contrast back, not only do we come closer to Army of Darkness' look, but we can see that there's actually quite a lot of detail hidden in Game of Thrones' grade. This is exactly the kind of flexibility you get with digital capture, and it's something any cinematographer will tell you has changed their lives. But as I've said before, this flexibility doesn't carry over well on low bitrate streaming and broadcast. These hints of detail barely register to the codex, so they simply discard it. But what about the other way around? What if we grade Army of Darkness to look more like Game of Thrones? Using the same idea, but in reverse, I start with the offset controls to get the overall balance into a similar place. This alone gives a huge boost to contrast, and honestly, I quite like the look. But the waveform is still spread much more than Game of Thrones. So then I play with gain and adjust the gamma and lift a bit to make sure the black levels aren't absolutely crushed. I use the fire to reference where my highlight should be, and the result is what I would call a claustrophobic use of shadow detail. Hmm. In my mind, at least, what's fascinating about this grade is that it kind of modernizes the image a bit, don't you think? In a sense, what you're seeing is how a remaster, for example, can take on a radically new look in an attempt to modernize an older film for newer audiences. That's a whole other conversation that I've touched upon in the past, so we're not gonna talk about it today. But it does make you wonder how exactly we are to reconcile artistic intent with something as objective as image quality. Let's try another experiment. Looking at House of the Dragon, this is a standard day for night shoot that really suffered in the grade. Now, I'm not sure if it was always intended to be night, given that HBO had promoted the show with BTS shots of this episode in full daylight, so, that's where it gets kind of tricky. It might have narratively had to become a night scene in order to fit into the story, but that doesn't change the fact that this grade is questionable. That's before we get into things like fire that doesn't cast light on the actors. 
Even many shots that aren't in obvious daylight have been graded so dark that the video levels are cramped down to obnoxious territories. But again, it's an intentional decision. Later shots in the episode show delicate shadow detail that is dimly illuminated by sunlight that does fill out the dynamic range very nicely. So what if I grabbed a similarly backlit shot from Rome, where light is pouring in from a window behind a character and onto the earthy interiors and lush fabrics? This is just a great image, dead on exposure with a healthy waveform that shows a naturally warm image. The highlights sit just right on things like hair, skin, shoulders, but the window in the back is really special with a warm white. It literally only touches the top of the waveform in the red channel, letting it blow out in a believable, pleasing way. I really wish we could go back to this. Like before, I brought everything down, but spent more time dialing in the color offsets and using the color warper to get the cool tones close enough to House of the Dragon. I threw a little bloom on the shot for good measure. Given that I'm working with an 8-bit compressed source, I could only push this so far, but I think it gets the idea across. I don't like this grade, but I could also see it airing like this today. So some observations, doing this test revealed a few things that I suspected. In general, these days, there seems to be some desire to protect highlights at all costs. I kind of get it. Digital highlights can be garish, and this is total conjecture, but I think blown out highlights have acquired a reputation for being cheap, low budget, or simply outdated. It's not like you don't occasionally see intentionally blown out highlights in modern shows from time to time, but they're not that common. This was actually something that really surprised me when I watched Severance last year. That show does try to evoke an older aesthetic, to be fair, but it's shot digitally, and on more than a few occasions, it shows some ambitiously bright shots that even clip at times. Honestly, I was kind of happy to see it. The other thing I noticed in doing this comparison is the change in film transfers over the years. As I mentioned before, the technology behind film transfers has improved a lot and the end result for some remastered movies can be drastically different color grades or palettes. It really can be a struggle to know what is merely being revealed by a new color grade versus what is being intentionally changed as part of some creative intent. But what's interesting is that there's a sort of intersection between these technological improvements and changing tastes in viewing. Let's look at Rome again for a second time. Rome is from 2005, right as TV was shifting to HD, and while the show was presumably finished in HD, the age of its transfer shows us a few things. There's bad highlight detail in some shots where you can see the image clipping in a very unnatural way, and the black levels are definitely too crushed at times. The shot I used here was impossible to fully match with House of the Dragon because the shadows in the foreground figure were completely crushed. But the overall contrast is very pleasing. It's visible, it's neutral, and it makes me wonder what it would look like if it was remastered today. Looking at Army of Darkness again, which I happen to grab from a new 4K version, you get the sense that there's a desire to preserve every bit of information. Even the darkest shots just touch the bottom of the waveform monitor, never really losing anything, and this is great. But I noticed that a lot of modern shows that try to emulate film looks have an almost complete aversion to crushing the black levels, especially in dark scenes. I think there's a sort of confluence of things happening here. The protection of highlights kind of goes both ways. I would actually say it's a refusal to allow any detail to clip except for the most obvious of specular highlights. High-end cameras can now capture 14 to 16 stops of information depending on what you're using with some, like the Arri Alexa 35, even boasting up to 17 stops. Cramming all that detail into a standard dynamic range video is doable and colorists work very hard to get the most out of their images, but the result can often be flatter and in my opinion, sometimes lifeless video. So where do we go from here? Well, trends come and go. Maybe one day we'll see higher contrast images again that aren't afraid to absolutely destroy their highlight and shadow detail or at the very least to just give us a naturally contrasty image. I'm sure we will at some point. In the meantime though, there are things you can do to make the viewing experience a little bit better. On the TV side of things, filmmaker modes promise a standardized approach to TV calibration. And this is one way to set at least a baseline expectation in the grading suite on the professional side, 
for what a home consumer TV can display. It maintains the intended D65 white point of all common broadcast formats, and most importantly, turns off all post-processing of the image. No motion interpolation, no noise reduction, no over sharpening. But honestly, the viewing environment is probably going to be a bigger factor for most people at home. Brighter settings might be less accurate in reality, but they also might be necessary for brighter ambient lighting. And not everyone wants to watch in total darkness, and I get that. Most LCD screens are simply not up to the task. The growing mainstream spread of OLED screens, though, should hopefully mitigate this issue in the coming years, but it'll take some time. Until then, I think filmmakers need to be at least somewhat more realistic about their audience's viewing capabilities. I feel there's a similar argument to be made for cinema and TV sound mixing these days, but I'll let someone else handle that one. The never-ending pursuit of a more cinematic image is understandable, and the change in technology available to both creators and viewers in the last 15 years is sometimes hard to believe. Back in 2002, a standard definition mini DV camera with 24 FPS recording was considered revolutionary. 20 or so years later, good lord, and now there are even phones that can record 4K video at 120 FPS. The speed of this change means that filmmakers' ambitions have grown and grown and grown, while viewers are, in many ways, always playing catch up. I've always loved talking about the technical production side of things, so if you like this video and want to see more, let me know in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed.